And so last week we talked about John the Baptist, him coming in. Now, if you'll notice that I get some questions sometimes about the, uh, the, the translation that I'm using here. You got so many translations of the Bible. But I use the New American Standard. The reason I've been using the New American Standard, and I encourage you to use it, is because it is the most true to the literal Greek and Hebrew. The Hebrew of the Old Testament, the Greek of the New Testament. It's important that you get as, as, as much as you can out of the Word of God in your own language. Okay? Okay. It's important that we understand that. Now, I know a lot of people are, are really locked in and love the King James Version. And I love reading it. It's beautiful. It's, po it's poetic. It's Elizabethan, basically. It's pretty close to the same stuff that Shakespeare used. So it's a beautiful language. But it leaves us lacking in understanding a lot of things that we find. Let me give you an example. There are several scriptures in the Old Testament, one in particular out of 2 Kings 9, where it says, I will cut off the house of Ahab, and I will cut off from him he who pisseth against the wall. <laughs> now, if you don't believe me, Deacon Glenn, is that true? Is it there? It's true. It's true. <laughs> And it says that in several places in the Old Testament. That's not the kind of language we use today, and we don't understand what it's talking about. If you don't believe me, go check it out. It's in the King James Version. But, yeah? What does it mean then? What does it mean? Yeah. You don't want to know. <laughs> we'll talk later. You, you, don't, you don't want to know. It's... No, I'm not going there. <laughs> talk, talk to me after the service, and I'll tell you what it means. All right. So we try to go with as much as we can, as literally as we can, because it's important that we know the Word of God and that we move in that direction and being able to understand it, absorb it, and live it. All right, so today we move on into the advent or the coming of Jesus. Now, what I want to do in the next few weeks is talk about Jesus. And I thought, well, we could go just through a biography of Jesus, but most of you already know that. Most of you have been in church and you, you know the story of Jesus. You know his works. So what I decided to do is break this up into three parts. Jesus, he who was, who is, and who is to come. It'll be three different sections that we use here. Today we're going to focus on who was Jesus. Now that sounds like an easy question. Who was Jesus? But even churches can't agree on this. It's called Christology. If you want to talk in theological terms, it's Christology. It is the study of who Jesus was. In our own church, we had a real battle over that that ended up causing a split within the Episcopal Church because we couldn't agree on who Jesus was. I remember our bishop one time several years ago, Bishop Salmon, I remember him interviewing a candidate, a priest that was coming uh, into the diocese. And I was sitting in on the interview and he said to this guy, he says, now, I have a question for you. Who is Jesus? And before the guy could answer, he said, because this is an important question. Who is Jesus? In this diocese, we know who Jesus is. Jesus is who he says he is in scripture. And if you think anything else other than that, this is not the diocese for you. We don't argue in this diocese over who Jesus is. The Christology is firm and it's based on scripture and it's based on New Testament and Old Testament prophecies. So we're focusing today on who was Jesus. All right, now, the quest for the historical Jesus. I remember this is one of the first things that I did when I first started my undergraduate in college, my undergraduate work. The quest for the historical Jesus. A lot of scholars back in the 1800s decided we need to know who the historical Jesus was, not the Jesus of the Bible. Now, I don't know whatever gave them the idea that the historical Jesus was different from the Jesus of the Bible. But they could not wrap their head around the fact that there were miracles, there was resurrection from the dead and all this. So they started a quest for the historical Jesus. Albert Schweitzer got involved in it. Several notable scholars. They've long been interested in the historical Jesus, but as scholarship often does, and I feel free to talk with this. Y'all know that I was a professor for 38 years. 
All right? So I have license to talk about this. <laughs> Scholars get into this research mode and they create problems because what they tell you when you're writing your master's uh, thesis and your doctoral dissertation is you have to find a problem and work with it and deal with it. Grapple with that problem. It's always a problem. So they create problems. And so in this particular thing, anything that did not make sense to them, they just did away with in their research. In other words, first thing they did away with was all miracles. They said all the miracles in the New Testament, they were just added in there, their fables, their, their myth. Um, they did away with the resurrection, all that right off the top. And then they started these symposiums. One of, one of them was really neat. It's a great, a great uh, name. It's called the Jesus Seminar. Wow. How much more exciting could that be? The Jesus Seminar. You're going to talk about Jesus. You're going to, you're going to get in and you're going, to, you're going to find out things about Jesus. You're going to get into the history and into the culture and into the, the political scene and, and the religious scene back in, in first century Palestine and all that. Well, yeah, they did to a certain extent. But what they ended up doing is taking passages of Scripture and they would go and they would study and do research on those passages of Scripture for a year and then they would come back together and they would vote on whether this was actually something that Jesus said and did or not. And the majority ruled. So what ended up happening is they ended up getting rid of about half of, of the, the New Testament Gospels. About half of it, they got rid of it. Because they said, Jesus couldn't have ever said this. Uh, Jesus really didn't do this. Jesus did never, he never would have made himself out to be God. Therefore, this was all added in later and redacted. And so you ended up with a mess. You ended up with, with, with something that would not be worth your time to take part in. So that's how the quest of the historical Jesus went. What they ended up with, Jesus only actually said about half of what's in Scripture. He never said anything about being God incarnate. He, they did agree he was a peasant from Galilee. He was born around 6 BC. He had many followers who embellished his story after he died and made him out to be the son of God in order to grow their church. See? Now, let me ask you just a quick question that I want to, to interpose here. Does it make sense that you would die for that? And many, many of them did. They died as martyrs. Why would you die for a lie if you knew it was a lie? There was no resurrection or promise of, the, of, of him coming again. All right, so that's how the quest for the historical Jesus ended up. However, there were many other writings about Jesus not found in scriptures. The Romans wrote about Jesus and about his followers. Several Roman government, of, uh, government officials wrote letters to Caesar describing the sect of Christians. They called Jesus by different names because they didn't understand who he was. Some of them called him Christus. Some called him Crestus. They just didn't know. They noted in their writings the beliefs of these Christians, and several of them had noted how they had arrested Christians, and they would give them under Roman law three chances to renounce the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. And if they didn't renounce it the third time, they were often executed or exiled. And so these writings verify the fact that Jesus lived, that he existed. Every time I hear somebody say, well, we don't even know if Jesus existed or not. Do you know there's more proof that Jesus existed than there is that, that the Caesars existed? There's more, there is more reliability in the New Testament than there is in the book Caesar's Gaelic Wars. More reliability, more validity. So there is no question that Jesus lived. But we're back to the question of, who is he? Tacitus, a Roman senator, wrote about Jesus and the Christians. Suetonius, a Roman writer who saw Jesus as an insurrectionist. None of these were Christians, mind you. Pliny the Younger, who inquired of Emperor Trajan how to deal with Christians. And he also had Lucian and Eumenius, all writing about the Christians and about Jesus with no thought of theology or anything like that. It was just a historical account. All right, now, 
In 93 AD, the famous Jewish historian of the first century, Flavius Josephus, wrote, this is a quote from the Antiquities of the Jews. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many of the Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. And when upon the accusation from the principal men among us, Pilate had him condemned to a cross, those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. This was written in 93, 93 AD. All right. Now, once again, scholarship got involved with this and said, there's no way Flavius Josephus could have written this. He couldn't have written it because he wasn't a Christian. Why would he have written that? We have no evidence of him ever becoming a Christian. I'd say this is pretty much pretty good evidence. But he, is, from the 17th century up until 1995, there was a big debate over what parts had been inserted in there by Christian copyists later on. The thing is, why would Christians be copying the history of the Jews? Most of them would have been Jewish copyists. That's number one. Number two, in 1995, there appeared some other writings, Flavius Josephus, reflecting this very thing. So now they've come full circle back to the idea that he probably did write this. But at any rate, you've got a Jewish historian accounting the life of Jesus. All right, in 93 AD, the Jewish, oh, I've already said that. Okay, this is Jewish antiquities. While the 17th century forward, there was much controversy as to whether Josephus actually wrote this. New evidence in 1995 pointed to the fact that indeed Josephus probably did write this account himself. Powerful testimony to Jesus. Now, there are many other stories written about Jesus over the next 300 years. Usually we only have what's in the New Testament, but there's a lot of stuff out there. Not necessarily good stuff, but there's a lot of stuff out there. You got the Gospel of Peter, you got the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Truth, and that's just the Gospels. The stories of Jesus that came along. Now the early church had to grapple with this because all this writing was coming along and most of it was fictitious in some way. The church had a loose canon of scripture as early as 80, 90 AD, before even John was dead. Let me give you an example of why this stuff is so wild. This is from the infancy gospel of Thomas. When the boy Jesus was five years old, he was playing at the ford of a rushing stream and he gathered the disturbed water into pools and made them pure and excellent, commanding them by the character of his word alone and not by means of a deed. Then taking soft clay from the mud, he formed 12 sparrows. It was the Sabbath when he did these things and many children were with him. Now what's the, the problem in Judaism right here? He's making mud. He's creating on the Sabbath. That was against Jewish law. Okay? But see what happens here in the story. And a certain Jew, seeing the boy Jesus with the other children doing these things, went to his father Joseph and falsely accused the boy Jesus, saying that on the Sabbath he made clay, which is not lawful, and fashioned twelve sparrows. And Joseph came and rebuked him, saying, Why are you doing these things on the Sabbath? But Jesus, clapping his hands, commanded the birds with a shout in front of everyone and said, Go, take flight, and remember me, living ones. And the sparrows, taking flight, went away squawking. But the story doesn't end there. (laughs) When the Pharisees saw this, he was amazed and reported it to all of his friends. And the son of Annas, the scribe, had come with Joseph, and taking a willow twig, he destroyed the pools and drained out the water which Jesus had gathered together, and he dried up their gatherings. And Jesus, seeing what had happened, said to him, 
Your fruit shall be without root, and your shoot shall be dried up like a branch scorched by a strong wind, and instantly the child withered. Hmm. While he was going from there with his father, Joseph, a child running, tore into his shoulder, and Jesus said to him, You shall no longer go our way, and instantly he died. At once the people, seeing that he was dead, cried out and said, where was this boy born that his word becomes a deed? Do you understand now why this stuff didn't make it into the canon of the New Testament? This is some wild fantasy thing. This uh, Gospel of Thomas was written probably in the third century. So it came much later. But so many fantastic stories came out about Jesus. People trying to grapple with who he was and just absolutely making up who he was in many cases. Right, there were many other fictitious stories written about Jesus in what we call the Gnostic Gospels. Gnostic, it comes from the word gnosis, which is knowledge, secret knowledge. Uh, the Gnostics in the early church said that there was secret knowledge you had to know to be able to get to heaven. Even if you were a Christian, you had to, you had to know these secret things to be able to get there. In the Gospel of Judas, which is a Gnostic Gospel, Jesus gives Judas secret knowledge about the kingdom of God and then tells him that he must betray him so that God's will can be accomplished. Also, interestingly enough, in the Gospel of Judas, Judas did not hang himself, nor did he fall head first into a field and burst open, as we find in the Gospels. But the other disciples caught him, hunted him down, caught him, and hung him. None of this stuff can be verified. So what happened is because there were so many fictitious, fictitious things being written about Jesus, the early church began to collect the stories and teachings they knew to be authentic and preserved them as an unofficial canon. Soon they determined that only the writings to be trusted were those written by an apostle of Jesus or a direct associate of an apostle. In that case, like Mark, who was an associate of uh, Peter. Furthermore, the writing had to have been written during the lifetime of the apostles, which ended with the death of John about 95 to 100. So if it did not meet that criteria and be verified by the early church that an apostle had actually written this or somebody very close to an apostle, then they didn't use it anymore. Okay? Now this is a standard that later on um, that, that Constantine's Nicene Council would recognize. The first century church recognized the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They've, they verified that as being authentic. All right? Later, the gospel of John was written in about 90. And since it was the last writing of a disciple that walked with Jesus, it was also accepted. In fact, John's disciples told him, you have to write about Jesus. You're the only one left that actually knew him. You've got to write your story. So that's why you get the gospel of John, which is totally different from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It doesn't contradict anything, but it fills in the gaps. And it tells you things that are not found in those early Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the letters of Paul were also accepted as Scripture, along with the writings of James and Jude, the half-brothers of Jesus, and of course the letters of Peter and John. Hebrews was also accepted, although the author was unknown and it was written during that time, the church verified that this was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ that wrote it. All right, now in 324, the Council of Nicaea it was convened by Emperor Constantine for the purpose of healing a split in the church. Can you imagine that? <laughs> a split in the church that was caused by Arianism. And Arianism was a heresy that came along and said Jesus wasn't really divine. He was created. Now God said, this is my only begotten son. Begotten, not created. That's why it, it, we have it in the Nicene Creed. Begotten not created. So Arianism had said that, that Jesus was a, he wasn't equal with God. He wasn't equal with the Father or the Holy Spirit. He was really not divine. He was anointed by God. All right, And that split the church. And so Constantine convened the Nicene Council to address that problem. One of the byproducts of that council was the official, the beginning of the official canon of the New Testament. Now the word canon means measuring read. But it was, it was used to measure up these gospels and these letters and writings 
to see what was verified as authentic by the first Christians. And that's what they kept. And that's what eventually became the New Testament that we have today. All right? Okay, so the most authoritative source of accurate information that we have about Jesus is actually in the New Testament. All right? So according to Scripture, who was the historical Jesus? Well, he was born in Bethlehem. We find that in Matthew. To the Virgin Mary, also found in Matthew. He grew up in Nazareth. We know that. He worked as a carpenter or as a tecton. Now, it's important to, to understand the Greek here because the word that is used to describe what Jesus did is not a common laborer who would just build houses. A tecton was more of a designer. He could build bridges. He could build oxen, for uh, uh, yokes for oxen. It was a higher level. Jim Ewing likes to say he was a civil engineer, but you know, I won't go that far, but it's, but it's close, you know, for a first century civil engineer. Uh, he grew up in Nazareth, worked as a carpenter. He was baptized by John the Baptist. We see that in Mark and several places. He went into the desert to be tempted by Satan for 40 days. His three year ministry is recorded in the four gospel. This ministry was largely carried out in the region of Galilee. Now, Galilee was a problem area. Galilee was not Judea. Galilee was out in the sticks. They had a different dialect, the same language, but different dialect. They had a different measuring system. They had different marriage customs. They didn't pay temple taxes, which was a horrible thing to, to, to Judaism. But they were different. That's where Jesus was. That's where he grew. That's where his ministry began. He wandered into Judea and then back out. You see him going in and out of Judea during this time. All right, three years. He taught about the kingdom of God and salvation in a message that was not expected by the Jewish people. You remember John the Baptist after he had said, we saw that last week, that John the Baptist said, Though he who sent me, to preach this gospel, to prepare the way, told me that the one whom I saw the Spirit descend upon like a dove and remain, this would be the one that I'm looking for. But later on, John would even send a message to Jesus. Are you really the one? Or should we look for somebody else? Remember that? And the reason for that is because Jesus was so totally unexpected, his message. As I've said over and over again, the people of first century Palestine expected a Messiah that was going to be a military leader, that was going to be a ruler, a warrior that was going to lead them in their revolt against Rome and restore the kingdom to Israel. But Jesus came, he's doing none of that. He has no interest in that. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And that's why so many of them missed him. His message is summed up in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, what's the word? Begotten. begotten, not created. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the message of the gospel in a nutshell. While some of the religious authorities, Sadducees and Pharisees, came to believe in him, you see this in John 12, 42, most of them hated him and plotted to have him arrested for insurrection against Rome and blasphemy according to the law of Moses. And you know how that ended. He was arrested, tried in a mock trial. Let me tell you about the, the, the trial of Jesus. It broke every Jewish law that there was. First of all, there was not supposed to be a trial at night. Secondly, a man was never to be executed any, any sooner than three days after his trial. If, Number three, there was always, the, if the witnesses couldn't agree, in Jewish law, it was more important to let a guilty man go free than it was to execute an innocent man. They broke all of their own laws for this. So it was a mock trial. Then he was turned over to the Romans who tortured him and then crucified him. You wonder why Jesus, you know, there's always a question about how quickly he died on the cross. Well, you don't realize the beating that he took prior to even starting out on the way to the cross. The Roman whips were leather and they had pieces of glass 
shards and, and, and metal uh, woven into them. So when they hit you and snatched, it literally just ripped the flesh off of your back. It was, it was a brutal thing. And Jesus had been spit upon, he had been beaten, he had been whipped. He, he had almost bled out before he ever got to the cross. That's why he died. Usually prisoners weren't uh, exposed to that kind of treatment before going to execution. But he was. And therefore he was on the cross only a short period of time, relatively. Sometimes it could take three days for, for somebody to die on the cross. But Jesus had already been beaten so badly that he had pretty much bled out before he was even nailed to the cross. He was crucified. On the third day after his death, he rose from the grave, as was witnessed by many of his followers, and for 40 days afterwards. Then he ascended into heaven with a promise to return. Now, according to the scriptures, Jesus was the Son of God. Now, that is actually a name. We get confused in this because we say, how could he be equal with God and be a son? Well, the Son of God was, was, was a, a, a name for the Messiah. All right? He was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. Mashiach in Hebrew, it means the anointed one. He was God in human form. Although when he became human, he poured out his divinity for that time so that he could be tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. He is the one who paid the price for all of our sins. He is the one who willingly trades places with us if we accept him so that we can have his righteousness by grace through faith. You remember, grace is unmerited favor, undeserved approval. We can have his grace by faith, by reaching out and taking it, so that he can become our sin, imperfection, and fallen nature. We become his righteousness. He, it's called in theology substitutionary atonement. He substituted himself for us in the punishment for sins. He is God's salvation for all of us if we only accept him as our Savior and Lord. Okay? Now, this is the most reliable information that we have about the historical Jesus, the, go the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the other writings of the New Testament. Furthermore, and this is important, I'm going to end up with this. You say, how do we know all that stuff is true? Well, think about it. The disciples, everyone except John, ran when he was arrested. Peter, in one of the Gospels, hung around for a while, and then he ended up running too. The only disciple that went through the entire trial with him and went through the crucifixion with him was John, who was a young man at that time and well-connected because his father knew the high priest. John went without fear straight into the trial, and he stayed with Jesus. All of those disciples that ran, something happened to them in a three-day period that completely changed their life and their minds about who they were. Every single disciple, with the exception of John, went on to be martyred, killed, rather than renounce that Jesus had risen from the dead. They were nailed to trees. They were run through with spears. They were boiled. They, they had gruesome deaths. And yet, the historical accounts of those deaths tell us that they all counted it as an honor and a privilege to die for Jesus. That does not even sound like the same people who ran when he was arrested. That's a powerful testimony that Jesus actually did rise from the dead. And then you've also heard me talk about his brothers, Joseph, Simon, Jude, and James the brothers of Jesus, half-brothers of Jesus, who did not believe in him, the gospel says, during his ministry, made fun of him, Luke tells us. And yet, when the day of Pentecost came, his brothers, his mother, his sisters were all there because they had seen him dead and they saw him risen. It changed their life. And that message went out 
to everyone that would listen to it. And 2,000 years later, we're still seeing lives changed by the power of this story of Jesus. But that is a discussion for next week. Because next week we move into who is Jesus now? Remember, he was, he is, and he is to come because he's alive. And he is with us all the way to the end. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.